Okay, I guess we're ready to go. I'm done. Let's go back to the flight line. Five, Five four, four, three, two, two one. one. Well, look at that go. <laughs> Hi, I'm Bob McDonald, and we're here at the British Columbia Rocket Club where they fire fast rockets really high. Would you guys like to fly in a rocket? Yeah. 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 You're going to need one a little bigger than that. But if you do fly in a rocket, where are you going to go? Well, you could go just straight up like these rockets, but if you do that, you're gonna come straight back down again. If you really wanna go anywhere in space, it's very different than getting around here on Earth. And on this program, we're gonna find out how people launch themselves off this planet and go to other worlds. So keep your heads up, because we're going into orbit. Now, if you wanna get around in space, the first thing you need to do is to get off the Earth, and that takes a rocket like this giant beast that was built to go all the way to the moon. But why a rocket and not just an airplane? Well, you could actually start out in an airplane, but you wouldn't get very far because you'll soon run out of air. There's no air in space for airplanes to fly through. There's nothing for the wings to hang on. There's no oxygen for the engines to burn. That's also why rockets like this don't have any wings. So if you want to get around in a place that doesn't have air, you need to use a different principle. So all that rockets do is go like this. That's right, they just blow really hard. In fact, this giant engine right here is nothing but a big blowhard. It takes its fuel and it burns it inside this big bell and then those hot gases come blowing out the bottom really, really hard and the rocket goes the other way. It's a principle called action-reaction. If you blow in one direction, that's an action. The reaction is that you go in the opposite direction. Let me show you how it works. I have a device here that knows how to blow. And if I let the gas that's inside this balloon blow down, that's the action. The reaction is that the balloon goes up. That's all that rockets do. They just blow really hard. And it's hard to believe that if you just blow hard enough and long enough that you can lift millions of kilograms straight up into the sky. If you've ever been in a, a really fast moving elevator, perhaps the elevator at the CN Tower or some of the midway rides at, the, say, the West Edmonton Mall or, or elsewhere, it's a little bit like that in that about six seconds before space flight, the spacecraft starts moving around a little bit. And then at T equals zero, all of a sudden you get this jolt in the bottom of your back that lifts you up off the launch pad. But it doesn't stop. It doesn't stop like a, an elevator motion would stop. It just keeps going and going. You feel this constant pressure, a lot of vibration. It feels, for the astronauts inside, like a tremendous pressure on our bottom and on our, on our back. It just keeps lifting us up more and more and more. It doesn't stop. I had a checklist in front of me, my emergency procedures checklist, which is vibrating so much I could not hope to, to read it. Once you get into, uh, into orbit, though, the engines are suddenly shut down. Everyone is flung forward in their seat harnesses. If it wasn't for the seat harness, we'd fly into the wall in, in front of us. You release your seat harness, and then you float around just like a cloud uh, inside the, the spaceship. So the launch is rather bumpy, but uh, it's well worth the ride just to experience weightlessness. Yeah! <laughs> Go ahead. All right, all right, all right. So we time out, time out for a second. <laughs> you know, when rockets take off, they start out going straight up, and it looks like they're just gonna keep going that way. But actually, they can't do that, because if something just goes straight up, it comes straight back down again. When rockets take off, they start out going straight up, but then they roll over under their back and they head out over the horizon. 
If you watch them really carefully, they go up and out like this. Okay, not like that. Here, you show us how it's done. <laughs> now, this path that the ball makes through the air is a very special curve. It's called a ballistic curve. And everything from basketballs to baseballs, bullets, and rockets all follow this same kind of curve. When Shaquille throws the ball further, he has to throw harder so the ball will stay in the air longer, and that curve flattens out a little. The harder he throws it, the farther it goes, and its ballistic curve flattens out even more. Now let's suppose he can throw the ball at super speed. Wow! A super hard throw would send the ball flying really high right over the net and even right over the horizon. He could make a shot all the way across the country. Even harder, and he could sink a basket in another country. <laughs> and if he made a super, super throw, something very special would happen. If the ball went high and fast enough, the curve that it follows would be the same as the curve of the Earth. So it would fly all the way around the Earth, eventually ending up right back where it started. There it is. Over the top. Whoa! Whoa! Now, that's what I call making a basket the hard way. Good one, Shaquille. Good shot. Yeah, all the way around the world, man. It's good. Yeah. It doesn't matter what you throw into space. If you can get it above the atmosphere and moving at a super speed of 30,000 kilometers an hour, that object will orbit around and around the Earth. Place two objects beside each other and they'll orbit together. It kind of looks like they're not moving at all, but don't be fooled. Without air up there, there's no wind to make noise or slow them down. And from 400 kilometers up, the Earth seems to pass beneath you very slowly. It's hard to believe you're moving more than 10 times the speed of a bullet. No wonder rockets use so much fuel. They have to go really, really fast. Now, putting yourself in orbit is one thing, but what if you need to meet someone else who's already up there? Well, that's what Canadian astronaut Chris Hadfield had to know when he flew up on the space shuttle to the International Space Station. We're sitting on the globe, and the space station sort of fixed in orbit, and we go around and around with the world turning underneath. And so if you're launching from Florida, let's pretend my thumb is Florida. You have to wait until Florida is underneath the orbit of the space station. Because if you launched over here, you'd be in this orbit and the space station would be this orbit and you could never get together. So you wait until your orbit is underneath the space station's orbit. Then you launch and you race like crazy to get into the same orbit as the station. You're probably below it. And then you very slowly adjust your orbit so you catch up on it very relatively uh, delicate, slow, careful basis until you're right beneath it, and then you're ready to do that final approach and docking with the space station. How hard is it to do that, to, to know where you are, where it is, because the, the movement is really fast. It, it takes a huge cooperation uh, to keep track of where the station is, going around the world. Uh, you, you have to know very precisely to choose your moment when you're going to launch, because sitting in the shuttle, we, we don't know where the station is. Someone else has to do all that math for us. We launch at the appropriate second, and then at first we're so far away we can't even see or, or use our radar to lock onto the station. So the ground calculates where the station is, calculates where we are, and says, okay, you need to point your rocket this way or the shuttle this way, fire your engines for this long, and that'll help you catch up. But then once we get within 50 kilometers or so, our radar can lock onto the station, and we can calculate it on board, figure out, fire our engines, catch up. And then for the last part, we do it visually. We just look out the window, line ourselves up. We actually have a camera staring up at a target on the space station, and we drive ourselves up just like two big trucks driving down the highway where you're trying to delicately pass something from one window to the other. You want to line up exactly perfectly, get your rates just right, and come in and hit at just the right speed so that everything locks together. What do you see out the window when all that's happening? 
I remember uh, on my first flight, I wanted to see Mir when it was way in the distance. And so when I woke up the morning that we were going to rendezvous, I was staring out the window. I asked Mission Control, hey, exactly which direction is it? I was looking in that direction, and the sun rose on Mir, and I could see it just as a star in the far distance, a few hundred kilometers away. At first, it just looks like another star. And then it starts getting big enough that you can see some, some structure to it, and it's reflecting the light differently. And then it gets bigger and bigger until you can actually make out, it looks like an insect. Uh, getting getting larger and larger, but then of course as you close in it starts more to look like a bunch of curtains hanging down at you because it's got the solar arrays and the big radiators and the other pieces of it and you're driving your spaceship up amongst all those pieces to try and dock at exactly the right port, the right spot on it where you're going to dock. So how it looks really changes depending how far away you are. Now, there are lots of different ways to orbit the Earth. Uh, one, you can do a low orbit where you only go up a few hundred kilometers and you go around the Earth this way. That's what the International Space Station and the Space Shuttle do. You can also do a polar orbit. That's when you go around the Earth this way over the North and South Pole. Now, the big advantage to this is that while you're doing that, the Earth is turning underneath you. So if you keep doing it long enough, eventually you will see the entire surface of the planet. A lot of our mapping satellites do that. They want to map the Earth. You can also go into a high orbit. That's where you're further out, and it takes you a little longer to go around the Earth, so you spend more time over each spot. And if you go really far out, say 36,000 kilometers out, it will take you 24 hours to make it all the way around the Earth. 24 hours. Does that sound familiar? Sure, that's the time it takes the Earth to turn once. That's called a geostationary orbit because the satellite will always be over the same spot on the Earth because the Earth is turning at the same rate underneath it. It's sort of like this. Suppose I'm the Earth and this ball is a satellite. On a low Earth orbit, it doesn't take very long to go around, an hour and a half or so. It's spinning around very quickly, but if I let it out, it takes longer and longer and longer so that it can turn at the same speed that I do, and it's always over the same spot. In this case, it's right over my face. That's called geostationary. The satellite seems, from my point of view, to be still in the sky. This high geostationary orbit is used by communication satellites that broadcast telephone and television programs like this one. That's why TV satellite dishes that you see in backyards don't move. They're always pointed at the satellite that looks motionless in the sky from the ground, but is in fact moving thousands of kilometers per hour as it journeys around the Earth. In the same way that satellites and spaceships orbit around the Earth, the Earth and the other planets orbit around the Sun. Everything is moving in circles. That means if you want to go from one planet to another, you can't just go in a straight line. Getting around in space means following circles within circles. In other words, matching your orbit to that of another object. Now, getting around in space is sort of like a dance, an ice dance. So we've come to a figure skating club here where Paris figure skaters Jessica and Ian are going to show us just how difficult it is to go from the Earth to the International Space Station. So Jessica is going to be the space shuttle, and center ice is the Earth. And Ian is going to be the International Space Station in orbit around the Earth. Let's see what it takes to get up there. It usually takes more than a day of circling the Earth just to catch the space station. Now suppose you want to go further than that, say to the Moon or Mars. You have to do the same thing again, but on a bigger scale. Now, center ice is the sun, and Liam is going to be the Earth in orbit around the sun, following a nice big circle. Ian is going to be the planet Mars, far away from here at the other end, and Jessica is going to be a spaceship traveling from the Earth to Mars. Let's see how that works. To get there, you first need an extra boost of energy to escape the gravity of the Earth. That comes from your rocket. Once you leave the Earth, you'll be on a much larger orbit around the Sun, and if your timing is just right and your aim is good, 
your path will cross the orbit of the planet you want to reach. When you get there, you'll be captured by the gravity of that other planet and go into orbit around it, or you could land right on its surface. To come back home, it's the same thing in reverse. Once again, timing is important because you have to catch the Earth, which is a moving target as it orbits around the Sun. Earth goes around the Sun once a year. Mars goes around, it's a bigger orbit, so it takes longer to go around, almost every two years or so, goes around. So sometimes, Mars is on the other side of the Sun from the Earth. You know, we're in different orbits. So you really gotta choose your moment. You'd like to launch when the two are closest together, when the distance between them is minimum. You gotta think about it in advance if it takes this long to get there, we launch and you gotta drive that distance. When is it the most efficient to go? Might be most efficient when Mars is on the other side of the sun and by the time your spaceship gets there, you've got the minimum distance. You gotta, gotta figure all that stuff out. The amazing part of all of this is that when we send spacecraft from one planet to another, it can take months or even years to reach their target. The solar system's that big. And when you're traveling that far, it only takes a tiny mistake to miss your target. More than one spacecraft has missed its planet and ended up wandering around the sun as a piece of space junk. We've missed Mars before. Uh, we've smacked into the moon before where we didn't mean to. Uh, we're learning as we go. Uh, it's, it's not an exact science, but it's an extremely unforgiving science. The space shuttles are getting old. They've been flying for more than 20 years now. They're very expensive and somewhat risky to fly. So engineers are now looking at new ways of putting people into space. This is the very last spaceship to go to the moon. It's the actual capsule from Apollo 17, which flew there in 1972. Not very big, is it? Can you imagine three people living inside this thing for more than a week to go to the moon and back? Well, NASA actually wants to go back to the moon again, but they don't want to use this kind of technology. The idea is that after the International Space Station is finished, after the space shuttle is retired, they want to go back to the moon, set up a colony there, and use it as a dress rehearsal for going on to Mars. The big question is, what kind of new spaceships are going to take us there? There are lots of new designs in the works for smaller, cheaper, and safer ways of flying in space. Some are little shuttlecraft to ferry people up to the space station and back, and others will take people all the way to the moon. There are a number of private companies building small spaceships like this one designed to take tourists into space. So just think, one day you may be able to buy a ticket to space aboard a rocket like that. So tell me about the Da Vinci Project. How does it work? We're going to float up under a uh, helium balloon to 80,000 feet. That's our launch altitude. And the flight will uh, begin from that point. We have a hybrid engine. We'll uh, fire the engine. It'll burn for about 75 seconds and take us to about uh, Mach 4 or 1.2 kilometers per second. And we'll fly a parabolic arc into space and uh, begin our re-entry. Well, what will the ride actually feel like if I was to buy a ticket on this thing? It'll be exhilarating, lots of vibration. Uh, we, uh, we're about four Gs on the way up, so it's not too bad, but re-entry is uh, about seven Gs. We have a, a capsule or a spherical capsule, six and a half feet in diameter, and that uh, decelerates at about seven Gs. What do you think the future of private spaceflight is gonna be like? It's, uh, it's a very bright future, Bob. Um, we're, in the, we're on the threshold of uh, private manned space flight this summer uh, to at the latest sometime this fall. And within the next five years, you're definitely going to have limited edition, is what I would call them, uh, suborbital vehicles that will be able to take uh, people on a suborbital flight. Our, our own company is planning a, an eight-person vehicle, so it's one to two pilots plus uh, six to seven paying seats. And we've looked at the numbers, and it's, it's attractive on our, our part to want to be able to do that and certify it and run an operation and indeed build several of these things and uh, deploy them around the world. Who knows where all that will lead? Maybe one day you'll be able to take a vacation in a space hotel, a giant wheel slowly turning through space. Can you imagine what the swimming pool would look like in a space hotel? In weightlessness, the water in a regular pool would float all over the room. But if the pool was in the shape of a big drum that slowly spins, the water would stick to the inside walls. 
Imagine the fun you could have swimming all the way around the walls and the ceiling. Imagine the crazy dives you could take. Today's rockets are not very efficient. Oh sure, they can get you into space, but they use up a whole lot of fuel, which makes them really expensive to run. They also don't run very long. Those thirsty rocket engines gobble up all that fuel in only a few minutes. A liftoff is really just a controlled explosion. Engine start and liftoff. That means our rockets are really just like bullets. They get all their energy at the beginning of their flight and spend the rest of the journey coasting on their own. But it doesn't have to be that way. Engineers are working on other types of engines that burn more slowly and for a longer period of time. This one, called an ion engine, doesn't put out a whole lot of power, but it can run for more than a year without stopping. It's a little slow at the beginning, but after a year of pushing and pushing, it can actually end up going faster than the rockets we use now. Here's one that runs on the free energy of sunlight. It's a giant plastic sail, made of the same shiny plastic you find on the inside of potato chip bags. When sunlight hits this sail, it makes a tiny push on the plastic. Since the sun is always shining in space, the sailcraft will be pushed faster and faster until it escapes the Earth to sail off to the moon or Mars. Sailing in space, all for free. Here's an idea to use nuclear power for space travel. And even an exotic magnetic ship that could capture the solar wind a super fast stream of particles that blows off the sun. We could ride it to the stars. There are lots of exciting ways to get around in space without using a rocket. Like that move? <laughs> you know, sending rockets to other planets takes a lot of energy because they're really far away. So that means they need to use up a lot of rocket fuel and rocket fuel is expensive. So scientists have come up with some clever ways to try to save on rocket fuel by using the Earth and gravity. Now there's two ways they do this. First is to launch your rocket towards the east. That's because east is the direction that the Earth turns. And if you think about it, if you look at the Earth from the North Pole, it turns in a counterclockwise direction. Now, if you're standing on the North Pole, you're not really moving very fast because you're just basically standing in one spot. You're moving about half the speed of the hour hand of a clock. But the farther south you go, you start to make circles around the center of the Earth. So if you're in a place like, say, Edmonton, Edmonton is moving at about 500 kilometers an hour every day. That's what you're moving at just sitting in a chair standing on the ground. And if you go further south and you get to the equator, you're making such a large circle that people on the equator are moving at 1,600 kilometers an hour. So spaceports are always positioned as close to the equator as possible. The American space shuttles take off from Florida, which is the furthest point south in the United States, and the Europeans launch from South America, a place called French Guiana, which is almost right on the equator. So by launching towards the east, they get a free 1,600 kilometers an hour that saves them that much rocket fuel. Now the other thing you can do is to take advantage of the fact that the Earth is moving through space as it goes around the sun, which is even faster. Faster. And here's something you can try with a friend to show how that works. And Larissa's going to give me a hand here. Woo! Well, that was a nice entrance. <laughs> Let's get rid of the Earth. Let's suppose that Larissa is a rocket that we're going to send off to another planet, and I'm the Earth. So first of all, we'll get ourselves into orbit here, and we're going to make center ice the sun. Now, every year, the Earth travels around the sun, and we're moving really fast. In fact, we're doing about 100,000 kilometers an hour. 30 kilometers every second. So if we want to send Larissa to Mars or another planet, instead of giving her a really big boost, we just give her a little one. Just send her off a bit. She doesn't quite make it. But meanwhile, the sun's gravity is pulling her back and she starts to speed up. And if we time it just right, she'll come back and the gravity of the Earth will grab her and slingshot her off. Now my speed is added to her speed. She's now got enough to make it all the way. And that's how you send a spacecraft to Mars, Jupiter, and beyond, the gravitational slingshot.
You can even do this slingshot more than once and use the gravity of more than one planet. Galileo, one of the robots we sent to Jupiter, used the gravity of Venus, Earth, and the Moon to make its trip. The Voyager mission was the longest journey to use a gravity slingshot. Voyager took advantage of the fact that all four of the largest planets in our solar system lined up on the same side of the sun at the same time. So Voyager was first sent to Jupiter, which threw it to Saturn. Then the gravity of Saturn tossed it further out to Uranus, and Uranus boosted it to Neptune, and Neptune kicked it right out of the solar system. Voyager's now headed for the stars. It took Voyager 12 years to make that trip to Neptune. Now that may seem like a long time, but without the gravity slingshots from all those other planets, it would have taken more than 20 years to make the same trip. Have you ever gone moon hopping? There's a place in space where you can jump from one moon to another moon and you don't need a rocket. These two moons live within the rings of Saturn and they pass so close to one another they almost touch, but not quite. So if you time it just right, you could jump from one moon to the other. The moons are called co-orbitals because they both follow the same orbit around the planet. Every now and then they approach in what appears to be a collision course and they pass really close, but they don't actually hit each other. Now, these little moons are just tiny ice balls only a few kilometers across. They don't have much gravity, so if you stand on one, you weigh almost nothing. You can float around with ease on every step. So if you wait till just the right moment when the other moon is approaching, it would come towards you and it would look like you're gonna get hit. It would look like the sky is falling as this thing passes overhead. And if you wait till just the right moment and you leap up, you float between the two of them, turn yourself around, you land on the second moon. <sighs> now this becomes your home until the two moons come back together again. Moon hopping, a new sport in space. So remember, traveling in space is all about rockets and timing. And if you want to go into space, keep, keep your, your heads up! up.